Well, we're kind of in the thick of it. We're still trying to, I mean, the project still at this point is trying to figure out what is being. And at the same time, try to be, account, be able to account for change. And we look out into this forest area here, or <laughs> park area, uh, things are changing all the time. But at the same time, we want to say that, that there's fun, something fundamental to existence. And up to this point, we kind of have this fight, this debate between Heraclitus on the one hand and Parmenides on the other. What's attractive about Heraclitus is that he at least has, has identified the problem of change. And it's the problem of what is the unity and what is the diversity. That there's something that has to remain the same uh, despite all of the differences, the thing that doesn't remain the same. Uh, on the other hand, you have Parmenides, who uh, is adamant about the fundamental nature of reality, that it is indivisible, that it is uh, impervious, that it's permanent, uh, eternal is even a word. Uh, what we don't really like about uh, Parmenides' view is that we don't exist under this idea. And so far, what Heraclitus has offered us is that uh, you know, everything is fire uh, and that we are all... Uh, part of the same thing. Well, it's not much better, is it? Because uh, the question is, well, where am I? Right? If I'm not me, if I'm just everything together, then wh where is me? <laughs> How do I exist? So they both have their issues, but there's still something about the intuitions that remain the same, that things do change, and that we've got to be able to account for that change. And the intuition that what is fun real is... is, is you know, impervious, that is permanent, right? And the idea there is, is that, well, you know, despite all the changes, we really do think that there's something underneath it all that's the really real. And what is that? So a big project at this point is, is trying to reconcile the two, right? To get what's changing with the permanent. Well, that's hard, <laughs> because uh, what is permanent doesn't change. So how can we get the best of both worlds? And Pedicles is going to give us an answer. He's going to try to reconcile change and permanence. Dangerous drop-off. If you're not careful, if you lose your step, you fall right over the edge. Now, this is kind of the position that Empedocles is in. Now he wants to get the best of both Heraclitus and Parmenides. He wants to be able to account for change. You don't have to look around long for, for very long to realize that things are in fact changing. Right? Sky, this breeze is coming through, these trees are growing, they'll fall down. Uh, <laughs> this cliff probably wasn't nearly as dangerous, right? If you fall off that cliff, you'll change real fast. So you, have to, you don't have to look around very long to be convinced that there's change. On the other hand, uh, Parmenides' reasons are really forceful. This idea that uh, what is fundamentally real is indivisible, is permanent, is impervious. So, how are we going to get the best of both? And like I said, Empe Empedocles walks a very fine line. Uh, on the one hand, he wants to keep the permanence of reality. On the other, he wants to keep the change in reality. Well, what he thinks is, is that he, he tries to provide this solution. What he thinks is, is that he's going to be able to get the best of both. Now you might ask yourself, does he just wind up falling off that cliff? Well, he starts walking this fine line about change. He says, well, there are things that change. And that's objects. Right? Now objects are uh, complex, meaning they have parts. Okay? So the trees around us have leaves and bark, sap, water, minerals, fiber. I've got bone, flesh, meat. Uh, I've got various chemicals in me. Now these are the things that are changing. There's the, the uh, parts coming in and out, the parts being replaced. Uh, basically, objects coming together, being composed, and then falling apart or decaying. Okay? 
So that, that's, that's what changes, is, is the objects. Objects change because the, 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 you know, whatever is real comes together to make it and then falls apart. So objects are what Empedocles thinks can account for change. So change is one narrow edge. The other narrow edge is permanence, is being. Now, Parmenides was really, I'm sorry, uh, Empedocles was really persuaded by Parmenides' arguments that what is fundamentally real is indivisible. It's always existed. Has, uh, uh, it's indivisible. All right? It doesn't change what's fundamentally real. But instead of saying that there's only one thing that is uh, fundamentally real. Uh, Empedocles thinks there's an infinite number of these. Right? So yes, there's the one. There's just lots of them. <laughs> there's lots of ones. Probably, uh, you know, the book uses the phrase an infinite amount of ones. Now he's also uh, trying to account for different kinds of things. So to account for different kinds of things, not only do you have the thing that's fundamentally real, but you have four different kinds. Earth, wind, fire, and water. And these fundamental kinds, uh, depending on your combination of these fundamental kinds, you get different kinds of objects. Remember, objects are the things that are changing. Objects are composed of these particles, of these, you know, million, you know an infinite number of ones. So this tree here, is composed of different combinations of earth, wind, fire, and water. Um, the ground very obviously is composed of ground particles. You know, we are probably, you know, I don't, I haven't really read Empedocles' reason, uh, 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 writings here, but we might even think of ourselves as combinations of a lot of them, because, you know, we got bones, so that's earth. Uh, we got, you know, you cut us open, we got, you know, you got, uh, you know, blood will come out, that's water. You know, we have to breathe, that's air. Right? Uh, we're pretty warm, and that's fire. So this is what's fundamentally real, is are these, these ones. There's just many of these ones, and there's four kinds. Earth, wind, fire, and water. And depending upon how they combine, you get different kinds of objects. So Pedicles has started to give us this account of uh, being and this account of change. Right? What's, you know, what's being, what's this fundamental reality, are the four kinds of particles, earth, wind, fire, and water. And what changes are objects. Objects are collections, compositions of the four fundamental particles and decompositions of the four fundamental particles. So Empedocles' story is really not over yet. He, he wants to do more than just simply say, this is what's changing and this is what's the same. He wants to try to you know, bring it all in, into a cohesive account. Now to do that, he identifies two kinds of changes, two really important kinds of changes. Right? Uh, and he thinks that all other changes can be accounted for uh, in terms of these two kinds of changes. So the first change is uh, composition, is things coming together. Okay, it's objects. You know, it's the uh, it's the objects becoming what they are. Right? And the second kind of change is, is the opposite direction. It's the things falling apart. Be, you know, not becoming what they are. Uh, so you know, looking at these trees around here, you know, dealing with the four fundamental particles, uh, we got some water. Right? Uh, trees require water for life. Um, you might even uh, uh, describe the rigidity of a tree as something earth-like. So you'd have some earth particles in there. Uh, you know, we talk about trees processing carbon monoxide into uh, oxygen. So you even have some air involved in there as well. And this, this process of a tree starting with an acorn and becoming a full-fledged tree well, that's composition. That's the tree coming together. So from an acorn, it starts drawing in these particles, right, to become this full-fledged tree. You know, at some point, this tree starts to die, right? And, uh, you know, it falls over, and it falls apart. Of course, not all at once, but it, you know, falls apart. It decomposes into its constituent elements. 
So these are the two fundamental changes in objects, is composition and destruction. So if you have these changes, right, then you have something doing the changes. Matter, particles, don't change themselves. They don't come together to make themselves, right? So you have to have a force that's causing the changes, okay? We have to have a force that's causing the changes. We have to have a force that's acting on the particles. So we have two changes, therefore we've got two forces, all right? So we have one force that's bringing things together. It's the composition. Now, Empedocles calls this love. Another word for it is harmony. All right. Now, today, we would probably use the word order, right? Or even life, right? The thing coming together to exist, to live, to be ordered. So that's one force. The other force is, uh, you know, the thing falling apart. So that's destruction. Uh, that's hate. Is, what, is the word Empedocles uses, or discord might be another word. Um, today, we probably use words like chaos and death. These would, be, these would be words to describe that force, okay? Now, you know, yeah, Empedocles uses the word like love and hate. Don't think of these as emotions. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about uh, coming together and falling apart. He's talking about composition and decomposition. All right, so we got these two forces, and Empedocles describes the movement, right, of these changes in four stages. So first, you know, just to pick a place, we have uh, the thing where it's the most of what it is, right? It's its, you know, highest composition. It's the most, most thing of what it is. It's, you know, the trees as they are now, right, this highest form of composition. Then you have the movement towards destruction, right? And that's when you add a little discord, a little hate into the scenario. So the tree starts to die, right? It starts losing its leaves. It starts decaying, right? The sap flows less through the tree. Then you have that stage where there's mostly hate, mostly discord, and just a little bit of harmony yet. So, you know, it's the tree when it's in its final, <laughs> final stages of life, right? Uh, it's not living very much anymore. It's still just kind of hanging on, but it's definitely on its way out. And then you, then you have death, right? That's all discord, right? No life anymore, no love anymore. And that's when the tree is falling apart to its uh, you know, basic constituents. Then there's movement from death to, or from hate to love, from death to life, from decomposition to composition. So we start with maybe something like the acorn. Um, or actually, you know, we start with Right, if we're dealing with just with death, we're starting with just the constituent elements. Right? You know, the next step is you add a little more life into the scenario. So you got something like the seed. And, you know, there's not all life at this point because the tree isn't completely what it is. But it's moving in that direction. So you start with the seed and it starts bringing together the, the, uh, the elements, right? The, the particles to form uh, this tree behind me and you know, it's, it's always on its way. It goes from that process of mostly death to mostly life to completely life, to complete composition. So you have the four stages and the movement from one uh, end to the other. And for Empedocles, this accounts for the changes in the universe. You've got the four fundamental particles. That's what really exists. That's the permanent existence. And you have how they're composed and decomposed. And that is the change. Well, you don't have to read Annex scores for very long <laughs> to figure out that uh, he disagrees with Empedocles. Now, the major point of contention that he has with Empedocles is this, this business with love and hate. Right? He, he doesn't have a problem thinking that there are forces at work on being. Right? He doesn't really seem to have a major problem with the idea that there are four fundamental kinds of particles. You know, they're following a tradition here, again, by observation. Right? They'll look out on the world and, and what we recognize as four states of matter, they recognize as like the four beings of matter. Right? So that's, that's not really how, what his problem is. The problem is, is, is uh, Empedocles' description of uh, these forces. He, uh, you know, the book describes it as uh, that uh, uh, Anaxagoras thought love and hate were too metaphorical. And you know, I think that's, that's true as far as it goes. 
Now, I haven't read Anaxagoras' work, but, you know, we can actually think of reasons besides, you know, you know our immediate, uh, 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 you know, our immediate stirring away from love and hate as active forces on nature. Uh, we got some other reasons uh, to reject this idea of, of love and hate. Now, first of all, you know, we're dealing with two kinds of forces here, right? Now, there's, there's lots of questions when, when you're dealing with more than one kind of force. I mean, for starters, right, you know, Anaxagoras, uh, sorry, Empedocles thinks that there's love and there's this hate, and that it moves from complete love to complete hate and back and forth again. Why would it do that? Right? Why, why would there be a movement back and forth between the two? Right? Now, you might think that, they, that the forces are completely at odds against each other. It's like, oh, okay, but then that would mean that there's nothing changing. Right? They're just com you know, completely stalemate one against the other. Uh, then there wouldn't be any change at all. Right? Well, you might think that um, uh, you know, one is stronger at a time than another. It's like, oh, okay, but... You know, first of all, if one's stronger than another, we don't typically think that the stronger force backs off, right? Uh, the stronger force defeats the other. Uh, so if there's this movement, this stronger force in opposition to another, and they, they go back and forth, when it really looks like there's some kind of order on top of these two forces. Well, if there's an order on top of these two forces, well, then you're dealing with one force that's controlling the two. And in fact, we do this today, right? Uh, we try to account for uh, forces acting in opposition to each other, and you know, one never completely taking over the other. We, we say, well, there's something on top of that. So Heraclitus, I mean, sorry, Anaxagoras, I think, does, does the same thing. He said, yeah, he, he rejects love and hate as too metaphorical. And I think for his money, it's like he doesn't explain why there's still this balance between the two, this movement back and forth between the two. So he wants to replace Empedocles' two forces with his one. Now to understand Anaxagoras a little bit, and again, you know, the book doesn't say this, and I haven't read Anaxagoras' writings, but something's kind of curious that Anaxagoras does that Empedocles is, you know, appears to be uh, silent about. And that's uh, what Anaxagoras does, is he says that uh, the, there are the four fundamental particles, but every object has at least some of all these different kinds of particles. Okay. Now, you might wonder why he's going into that. I mean, he, he, this is an ex kind of an extreme conclusion, right? Because that means that um, water has at least some fire and earth and air in it. A fire has at least some water and earth and air in it. So why is it that um, why is it that all these objects around us have at least some of every kind of particle? Well, you know, think about it. You know, the idea is that these four fundamental particles give us what's real, give us existence. So if we say that uh, you know this tree here has uh, earth and water in it and some air, but no fire, then there's something of reality that this tree is missing. Okay. That there's some fundamental part of reality that's not in this tree. And it, Well, if that's gone, then how is this tree real if it doesn't have what's real in it? So Anaxagoras says that everything has all these different, uh, has all kinds of particles in it, just in different combinations. Well, what determines what combinations each kind has, right? Why did they start having combinations to begin with? Anaxagoras has a story. You know, according to him, you know, if there are the, these combinations in these, these you know, different kinds of matter in different proportions, and there's some kind of change happening, then it, it's reasonable to infer that there was a time when uh, there wasn't a differentiation in objects, right? There was just one thing, and it was uh, it had equal proportions of all the different kinds of particles. There was something that was equal air and fire and water and earth, right? It was just kind of sitting there. So that's the source of the change, from this equal parts to 
compositions of different proportions. Well, what does that? What, what did that? Anaxagora says that uh, is separation. Okay. Separation of, you know, different clumps <laughs> of this stuff in different proportions, and that's why we have different kinds of objects. So I have some earth and some water in me and have some air and some fire, right, as we, as we talked about earlier. And this tree has, you know, since it's more rigid, probably has more earth in it than I do, right? It has less water in it than I do. It still needs water, but it's less water than I do. And this, this tree is cooler to the touch than I am, so it has a lot less fire. So, and, you know, of course, a lot less air for uh, Anaxagoras. So, these objects are combinations of the particles in different proportions. Right, well, how did that happen? Um, and Anaxagoras suggests it was, he said, the separation. Now, and he suggests the separation started happening, started occurring by movement. Right? Specifically a vortex. So, it's spinning. Right? All this stuff is spinning together in equal proportions. Well, have you ever seen a centrifuge? Right? The more you spin, say, like blood, uh, the more you have separation uh, from, you know, uh, from uh, dense to less dense, right? So, something like this is happening with Anaxagoras, is that all of this stuff in equal proportions just starts spinning, and it kind of hurls away, or spins off through separation, uh, different objects and different proportions of, of the different kinds of matter. All right, well, the question that we very quickly have is, well, what did the spinning? Now remember, Anaxagoras, probably, probably one of his motivations here is to provide one force. Because right? we got one kind of change, that's the spinning. Right? That's the spinning. Uh, there's no slowing down right? for Anaxagoras. There's nothing slowing down, there's just the spinning. And this accounts for things com coming what they are. So what, uh, what started the spinning? He doesn't like love and hate, too metaphorical. But he still sees a fundamental order to everything, right? Everything works together in a really particular way. It's not as if these trees can start living without water, right? There's a causal order to everything around us. So Anaxagoras says, well, the reason, the, what accounts for that order is mind, is reason, is uh, uh, intelligence, all right? Intelligence. And this mind is what started this uh, vortex spinning and controls and controls the different kinds of things with the spinning, okay? With the separation. Now, to kind of hold off any misconceptions, uh, Anaxagoras' mind is not the same thing as Heraclitus' Logos, right? Heraclitus' Logos uh, was made of the same stuff. Uh, you, know, he, you know, his, his Logos, his, uh, uh, you know, his, his universal reason is made of the same stuff uh, as everything else. In fact, everything is one in, in, in this fire. Not so with Anaxagoras. And for Anaxagoras, the mind is not a combination of the particles. And remember, uh, the thing that has this force upon the particles can't be the particles themselves. Particles don't start themselves in motion. So it has to be something else. Well, if it's something else, it's not composed of earth, wind, fire, and water. Right? In fact, uh, Anaxagoras says that this mind is just one thing, one kind of thing. It's utterly simple. It doesn't have any parts. It's not composed of anything else. So, it's really different from Heraclitus' Logos. So just to kind of summarize, uh, Anaxagoras says that what's, uh, what's still fundamentally real is, like the, is the one, along with Empedocles, is the one, uh, there's just four kinds of the ones, and there's infinite numbers of them. And Pedicles says that there's two forces, love and hate, and this accounts for composition and decomposition. Uh, uh, Anaxagoras says, oh no, the, you know, there's still an order there, so there's going to be one mind, or one force, and the force can't be of the things that, you know, that it's acting upon, or that's being forced. So th there's this mind, this nous is the Greek word, N-O-U-S, nous, uh, that's acting upon the four fundamental, fo uh, four fundamental particles, causing the spinning, for causing the different kinds of stuff in different proportions to split off.
Empedocles and Anaxagoras got us started on this idea of particles being the fundamental basis for all of reality. Lysippus and Democritus, commonly called the atomists, uh, carry it uh, one step further, try to prove upon it even more. Now the book says something like, uh, the theory bears a strong resemblance to our current scientific theories. It's actually kind of the other way around, that our current scientific theories bear a strong resemblance to the atomists. <laughs> um, but the atomists, Lysippus and Democritus, they had uh, somewhat of a change to this idea. One of the first things they tried to do uh, is account for space. Now remember the problem that Parmenides brought up regarding space regarding nothing. And so we typically think of space as uh, uh, what contains matter, or you know, matter takes up space. But if space is nothing, then Parmenides' arguments seem to cause a real huge problem for this. Well, the solution that the atomists offer is, is a little bit different. They say, look, uh, we, you know, we agree with you, Parmenides. We can't talk about nothing. But space isn't nothing. Space is something. Now what space is, is something non-material. They suggest it's non-material, that it's uh, a receptacle for matter. So again, you know, we see this idea that matter is what occupies space. Well, here's kind of the first formulation of that, that space is a receptacle for matter. It itself is non-material. Non-material. Now that's important to remember, it's non-material. They also had a little bit something different to say about the particles themselves. Uh, the particles are not of four kinds. Remember Empedocles and Anaxagoras uh, thought particles were the four kinds, earth, wind, fire, and water. The atomists think they're only one kind of particles, the atoms. And these atoms are just like the Permidian one. They are uh, indivisible, hard. Uh, they're also really tiny. We also thought there was an infinite number of them, and that they've always existed, so they're eternal. Now, what accounts for the difference in objects, right? they still seem to be going along with this idea that objects are, what com are, are, um, are composed of atoms. And they seem to go along with this idea that objects come, you know, are composed and decomposed, and this is, this is movement and change. Um, but what accounts for the difference in objects is the arrangement of the atoms, specifically something like a Pythagorean arrangement. So length, width, depth. We could probably even go so far as to talk about density. Um, these real typical ways that uh, matter is measured. So what's going to account for the difference in objects is the, is the Pythagorean arrangement of them. So we're, you know, they're kind of borrowing from a lot of different ideas. They've got Pythagoras. They've got, you know, they're trying to respond to Parmenides. Right? They're still, in a sense, borrowing from Empedocles and Anaxagoras. So we talked about their arrangement. Now, uh, a question is, um, what accounts for the change in the objects? So remember what Empedocles and Anaxagoras were doing. They said, look, we... We notice that there's change in objects, and if there's a change, then there's a force. Well, for uh, the, the atomists, uh, what explains change is that it's random. That it's random movement of the atoms. Now, you might ask yourself whether this is actually an explanation. You might ask yourself what the definition of random is. Um, if, you know, under some common notions of random, the idea is that if, if uh, something is random, there is no explanation. There's not one called for. So if you roll a dice and it comes up three, and you say, why did it come up three? And the reply is, it's random. Meaning there is no reason why it comes up three as opposed to one, two, four, five, or six. So this is an interesting move. Uh, on the part of the atomist, saying what accounts for change is randomness. And this looks, this really looks like what they're saying is 
you know, somebody asks why are there changes in objects, and by saying random, it really looks like there's no reason, there is no explanation, it just is. So we have uh, the atomists, and they're pretty different. I mean, they've done, they've done some differences than Empedocles and Anaxagoras, but we still see this progression of uh, one theory building upon another, or adapting um, and kind of in reaction to another.